this little pet project has gone too far. It's, it's something like that. La. I think so. Le. Wow, eh, that changes everything. Now I understand why it's so basic. Le. Hello, new episode. A bunch of people did ask, can I talk about starting my own business, which is like contrasting from pet, right? Which I'm going to do so today. However, I think the good side, most people know. So I'm going to share more about some of the harder, more difficult stuff that maybe you might not know. For me, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. There is a family business where weekend jobs, right? If I'm not working at DHL packing or I'm not giving tuition or guitar classes, where I spend a lot of my weekends working is with my family business. I make cement and stuff like that. I always had an idea of what a job was going to be like. I remember at uni time, right? Or even poly time, I start buying like Go G2000, buy shirt, buy like beige pants. Thinking like, okay, la, I mean, you're going to graduate soon, you're going to get a job, you're probably going to work in a CBD. But on one end, I was always very in that in my family business right there's this sense of ownership and this this tightness because the people working there are mostly family of course we also got hire other people right I've always felt like okay I'm gonna join the corporate world and I'm probably gonna leave that behind and then spend time with my family on the weekends my family is always wanting me to join the family business but I always felt like I don't know how to truly grow that business it was something that never really interests me when I graduated I was looking for something a bit more fun like, to be very honest and right then and there, there was there was this company that was in the news a lot and they got into a scandal. There was this very notable local influencer company. They were at the front lines of marketing and they had this scandal that hit them. All their company chats, among other things, were leaked. And so as the usual Kepo Singaporean with no job, right, I basically read through the, the Kepo text, right, and beyond, okay lah, certain things are be scandal, certain things are be unprofessional. But beyond all that, when I looked at it, right, I saw a family bond. I saw that that group chat is very similar to the group chat in my family and the family business. So when I saw that text message, right, I was very intrigued in that business. And that's when I realized I have this friend, Audrey Langney, that works inside that business. And so I, I reached out to her and I said, hey, your, your company hiring and all. And I remember she replied, "Ha, huh, you sure you want to apply now after like the saga blew up right but it was because of the saga that I I saw the inner workings of the business and I was drawn to it she arranged an interview she said oh maybe I can ask uh, whether the BD side is hiring so back then I didn't know what business development was but it sounds freaking amazing my degree was in business management and so I thought okay lah I can't be that fish out of water right and this was the first job I applied since I graduated. Um, it was the first interview I've had uh, since I was prepared to look for a full-time job. And I went to the office and I remember it being some industrial building. They're like, wow, this company like, like never make it the kind of vibe, right? But then when I opened and I walked in, right, wow, their space is so beautiful. Back then when people were doing those Google kind of office, right, theirs was very close. And so I was immediately drawn to that office, okay? I think it was only when I arrived then I heard that, okay, your interview is actually going to be with the co-founder. And so I just bomb lah, you know, basically I talk about my understanding of business law and what I would do in influencer marketing, how I feel like it is the future. And more importantly, I think what I talked about was that being a guy that comes from a very small family business, they understand how difficult it is, the, the trade-offs that you make as a business owner. And I'm prepared to do the work to earn my stripes. The boss there, right, she shifted around her seat and then she said, John, I'll be honest with you, I'm not looking for a business development executive. So in my head, I'm like, okay. Okay, you wasted my time, woman. But then she said, I'm looking for a country manager. So then in my head, right, I was thinking, are you asking me, a fresh grad with no business experience, to interview for a country manager? Or are you asking me to get the f*** out of here, right? So I started interviewing for that position instead. If you give me the shot, I'm willing to try. A few days later, while I was waiting for the reply, she just texted me at night. And she said, do you still want it? I said, yeah. Then she said, okay, can you start Monday? Maybe I never asked about the money. I didn't give a f you know? I was just very excited to land my first job. And my first job was in management. And a company that I thought was very, very fun and like cutting edge of marketing in Singapore. And I wanted to be a part of all that. The people inside were, were everything I thought them to be. They were, they were intelligent. They were fun. They were experimental. And I learned a lot. It's a great company, okay? And then about four months later, another saga hit the company. I remember I had a conversation with the bosses there, which is, we might have to split out the company a bit because the company name might be a little bit tainted already. And so me as business manager of this influencer marketing company was to continue that role, but then I was to become the managing director of one of the subdivision company. So that one's gonna specialize in video content. And that was where I got my first brush at actually creating shows. That was one of the first things I ever shot was Bit of All 
traits with Yen KK. So she's my first ever influencer love, the first ever host I ever worked with, and we we made bit of all trades together. And so we begin making weird air shows, right? Shows that I just think in my head that we just do a lot because what else we're gonna do, right? It was fun. My salary was about $3,000. A few months later, I think the company kind of stabilized and normalized a little bit. And that was when I was asked to go and start a Thailand and Vietnam division of the company. That was fun. I was 25 years old, interviewing people and telling them what this company's heritage and story and methodology is about. And then in mind at the time, I worked there maybe about half a year. From that country, I made my first three hires. I remember working with that division of the business until they broke even. And then I came back. I was happy to be back because I was in another country about three to four days a week. And then I come back and I work one day and that one day is split across two companies, weekend, and then I'm going to go back to that country again, right? But it was very difficult for Pat to kind of understand why my job led it. Then the salary 3,000 still, right? And with the success of that, I was asked to go over to Vietnam. So I remember it was during that time that I decided I want to, I don't think I can do this for so long. At age 27, my BTO have arrived already because we, we, we balloted towards the end of my NS period. So as the 27 year old mark coming, right, I realized I needed to propose already. And at that time, that was when my credit card debt started to spiral. So I decided, okay, 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 okay. I need to find a new job so I can buy a ring, so I can marry my wife, so I can get my house, right? And so I thought, okay. What I did was I went to count the amount of revenue I've made for the company across the four business units that I work with, right? And with all that, I went to the founders and asked for a raise. So I asked for a near 30% raise. Yo, that's crazy. Eh? You must bear in mind that up to that point, I've worked in that company maybe one and a half years only. And they gave me exactly what I was asking for. My salary from that day became $3,800. So I was damn happy. I felt like I can continue to work here, even though it's getting a lot, a lot more challenging. In this period, I was still building the Vietnam office, right? And so I was gone four, five days a week and I'm back on weekends with my family. I remember I told my family that I asked for a huge raise and I got it. My salary is now $3,800. And then I remember my mom just sit there. Right? Then her tears come down. Then she say for $3,800, I don't see my son and your girlfriend don't see your boyfriend. Then I realized she's right. It was the amount of time that I spent on building someone else's dream. I could have built my family business that I might one day inherit. And so fast forward about a month later, I decided that I'm going to quit. When I was serving my notice, this man, uh, Mr. Jackie Yap, he came to ask me whether I could build Vulcan Post as a company with him. Mr. Jackie Yap told me, if you join my company, you try and build it with me, right? I'll give you a percentage of what I own. And then back then I'm like, okay, maybe don't give me first. Um, I'm going to try, we see whether we can make money or not. Uh, whether I want to be here or not because I don't think I want to sell a digital magazine uh, sponsored content for the rest of my life. So since I haven't found a job, right, I decided, okay lah, I will join Mr. Jackie Yap and my one condition is that we have to change the company name. I didn't like this previous company name. We call it Gravity Media. The name of the company actually is super dumb man. and we have the whole group chat because it was all ideator on WhatsApp with the early team, right? I was like, guys, how about, you, how about we call it Gravy Media because everybody likes gravy. There was this other colleague that says, how about gravity all spelled out? Then Lim just removed the vowels, then just gravity. Then that was it. We made the logo on the PowerPoint slide. I just tell him. And that's how Gravity Media started. There were a lot of brands that were under incubation and brands that we were going to build, right? Brands that you all might remember, like Millennials of Singapore. Now it's MOSG. Please go and subscribe. Discover Singapore. We also did the playbook. That was a dense little project. Falcon Post. Back then it was pure editorial and we were exploring video. Once again, back then, uh, year was 2017. Social media just had videos only uh, in 2017. Which means we were, wow, we were at the precipice uh, of new age content because we are going to video now and that was a fun period right and we built shows like real talk and all that stuff and within two to three to four months i think one of my friends called me and said i didn't i didn't know you're raising money so i said no i'm not raising money do you want to invest then he said i sure and so we went through a bunch of due diligence and so they popped a nice million dollars into the company and that was when i added my name and officially became a director and co-owner of gravity media because gravity media had a bunch of employees before i joined and the rest are gonna quit to join us right we started day one uh, if i'm not wrong uh, with like 11 or 12 employees already and 
It was fun eh. It was because it was a bunch of people were all fresh grads. Nobody really know what's going on. Social media is taking on a life of its own. It's completely new. The cost was low and we were making decent money. Gravity Media then became a media publication with its own creative agency. It perhaps was one of the most satisfying period of my life. The first two years of Gravity Media was a dream. And I remember I could be the man I want to be. I want to be nice to the people that I work with. Every year, we gave them a raise. Every year, we gave them a bonus until reality started to set in. As we worked together happily two years later, they were at the stage that I was when I wanted to quit my first company in that they needed much more money now. And I, I completely get it. There was a point where because our prices were like this and we got everybody at fresh grade and hungry and everything and their salary was like this. And so every year we give bonus and raises and bonus and raises. And so at some point, right, we reached a point uh, where we are damn close to equilibrium already. I believe no employer wants to go into the office, right? and see his employees unhappy and when you talk to them you feel like they wronged you you know or like you owe them some money or you're underpaying them nobody wants to feel that way it's a shit feeling and I above all being a super people pleaser right I cannot you know so we literally use profits from our first year to fund bonuses on our second year and then profits from our second year to fund bonuses and increments on the third year it was not at all a sustainable growth. We had to make some very real decisions. In the past when you were not very good, I gave you a raise anyway, until you reach the point where if I kept doing this, the company will go bust. I don't like to use the word, oh, we are like a family. I, I don't think I articulate this to them ever because I know it's very cringe. But in my head, right, I did treat them like family. Or I would like to think I did, like, to be very honest. I'm sure I pissed some people off also. There was a lot of guilt whenever their performance is not good because when family let each other down, family don't end ties ma. There was this particular person, her work was not great. But she's a nice person, you know, and she worked well, integrated well with the rest of the company. It's just that the amount of output is slow and the quality is low. And so we give chance, we even lowered the KPI. And that's what we try to do to justify this person. But of course, when the cost and the, what the income of the company start to play a balancing game already. When it comes to increments and bonus, then we need to ask ourselves, if we give everybody evenly, it means our top performance are underpaid. La. They are not getting the benefit that they should get. So what we did, we hope and pray and think that said employee will understand if we don't give them a raise or a bonus because they did not bring the company to the next level. Um, in fact, the company is subsidizing her salary. We did that the first time we gave her a small raise and so she understood. The second year, while she did not improve, we still kept her around. Once again, I don't blame her at all, okay? It's, it's our fault. We told her there will be no raise for you this year because we wanted her to feel a sense of urgency that in order to get a raise and a bonus, you need to put in that work. You cannot cruise with us. And that was when I think after two, three years of bad service and appraisal cycles, she started looking for another job. She banded together with a group of people she was close to and started the narrative that Gravity Media has no progression, which I know in my heart was to be untrue. But that is her truth. That indeed happened to her. And so that was when I took a huge major step back. I realized the way we run the business cannot be like that. And in order for the good contributing strong members of the business to properly benefit from their growth, such that the business grows as fast as their ambitions, we cannot say like, be nice. No, you know, if you want to be nice to this employee that's fledging, you are not being nice and accountable to the other employees that is high performing. And so this completely changed my mindset and I became very, very down because management became a burden. I hated having to deal with people problems because I, just, I only want to give raise and bonus to be very honest. Then after that, we just work together, you know? But no, like, here and there, there's always misaligned expectations. And I get it because I feel like I've been an employee before. I've been the subject of a bad employer before. And I know what that feels like. And so it became very, very depressing that I didn't want to run a business anymore. But when shit hits the fan and you have to make decisions for the business, sometimes you feel that because I have a close relationship with them, maybe they will understand why I need to make these difficult decisions. That's what I feel. What they feel on the other end, once again, understandable, is that since I'm that close to John, John will understand that I will not accept this. And so we had these two opposing clashing times. It's a matter of 
being a good friend or being a good business leader. And this is distinctly different in that being a good business leader requires you to sometimes become a very bad friend because you don't think of them as individuals. You kind of also need to think of them as one company so that the company lives, grows, thrives to survive, to fight another day so that 20, 30, 40 people don't lose their jobs overnight. But you disappoint that one person that you treat like family and you thought treat you like family. That is the crux of building an SME. I think it's extremely challenging and I've grown to learn and this, this quote actually came from Adrian, which is the co-founder of, of uh, SK. He said, the people that grow with you at this stage of your life or the business may not necessarily be the same people that will grow you or your business in the next level. There are some people that can particularly shine when the business is a 10-man team. But when it's a 20-30-man team, you need different kinds of talent. And that really resonated with me because that was a, that was a very elegant way, I think he put it. And that was very painful for me because I'm a guy that like, I get attached. I get attached to the people, I get attached to things. There was one point of time I remember in my business where I had like five key people that I was very close to as well and they were very instrumental to the business. There was a falling out and when the falling out happened between me and one of that person, right, I felt like I'm the worst boss, I'm the worst friend and I cannot do anything right because I seem to disappoint and offend everybody at every turn. And I felt super lousy and I remember going to Jackie multiple times that year, maybe like four or five times that year, telling him, I think I want to quit. I was gonna quit the own company that I built because I felt terrible and lousy. There were nights that I just come back and I just sit there and Pat comes out with her usual energy and I hide them when she sees me there and I'm just looking out the window. She just quietly sit beside me and when she holds my hand then sometimes my tears drip out because I just feel like shit. And she knows I need to go to work tomorrow again, you know. From the time where we all have lunch together every single day when that falling out happened, I was just eating alone. Oh. I eat at my desk. I decided, okay, I think I'm going to resign. So I had a real final chat with Jackie and I said, I think I'm gonna go, what's the plan? Jackie, once again, you must understand, he began his career the business as a writer. And so when we expanded the business to multi-channel, we had a whole creative agency of which I was the creative director for. I couldn't possibly hand all that to Jackie. Ma. Jackie said it's likely that he will wait around and see if anybody steps up to fill in my role. If not, he might just end the company and just keep the publications that he can manage. I sat there and then I looked out the glass of the meeting room and I saw that, eh, we had close to 40 people working here. They are happy to be here. Maybe this is not their dream job. Maybe they don't think they're going to work here forever. But for now, they are willing to give me their best years. I almost left because of five people. And because these five people felt very close to me, they felt like my whole world. That was when I looked around and I think coincidentally, one of our ex-colleagues, Melissa, she also reached out to me and then she told me like, John, there's a lot of people in the office that care about you and we're worried about you. So it was one of that moments that I realized that I was about to abandon 32 very happy people and hit because I hit myself because of five people. And so I sat down the five people and we figured out the moving forward. Some of them uh, after that were not part of the company anymore. And that was how I regained control and wrestled back soft and hard control of my company. So then I want to stress that being an employee in itself is a superpower. Because when the going gets tough, the tough can get going or the tough can go and quit or be tough somewhere else for someone else more deserving. That was when I realized that this was one of the trade-offs that I'm giving up when I run a company. The inability to simply say I quit. And so if you ask me now today, do I love my job? The answer is yes. But did I love my job every day for the last six, seven years? No. There were many years that I've been, that I wanted to quit. <laughs> that I hated it, that my Monday blues were so strong, I came and I came MC to my own company just so I can be mentally in a better place to then be a better leader again. Having said that, there's also positives to running your own business. You have control of your time, sure, but it also means that every problem that cannot be solved becomes your problem. Um, so that looks like 14 hour days, 16 hour days, staying overnight by yourself in the office to finish a deck and then next morning be at the client's office to pitch it. And then when you pitch it, you lose it. You ask yourself, now that I didn't win this, I may not have enough money to pay salary at the end of this month. 
One of my favorite things of being able to run my own business is the ability to impact lives. I get to align the business beliefs with my beliefs in that if there are charities that I would like to support, if there are causes that I believe in, if there are experiments I want to try, I get to actually try them. Some of y'all want to be a boss so that y'all can design the work environment. I agree with that. I think that's the real superpower. Being able to kind of affect culture a little bit is great. Finally, after seven, eight years running this company, I feel like for the first time in a long time, I can die off. If I quit today, Jackie doesn't have to end the company. The company is made out of enough strong, talented, intelligent, determined people to bring us to the next level to grow without me even. And I'm not quitting lah, huh? Unfortunately, I'm not yet lah, huh? I'm gonna wait for Pat to come back and then I'm gonna bring her to my emo spot last time when we, uh, when we quarrel, usually over my work or colleague related. And then I would drive there and just sit there and think. So in your opinion as my wife that I've seen through it all, right? What is some of the ugliest parts of uh, my entrepreneurship journey? I think are uh, the sleepless nights that you get during a COVID period where you were struggling to think about how to pivot your business because he have like 30 mouths to feed, right? Mm. And he also don't want to fire people. It stresses him if he has to let people go, um, especially when the business, let's say, is not doing well. It's like not because of the employee's fault. Yeah. Yeah, because of oh, unfortunate... Hardest, eh? yeah. Because my business not doing well means your fault. It's my fault. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Then other than that, I think um, it always lead us to quarrel. Last time lah. Last time. We have come a long way. Very. Uh, last time when he come back late. And I can never understand why he cannot knock off at 6pm. Just like everyone else. I was a bit too silly. I was a bit too shallow to see it. Yeah. But over time, I realized that, eh, if I wanted all his time, like, or whenever he can like, make time for me, then I need to accept the ugly side of you also, ma, that there will be times that he need to prioritize somebody else's livelihood over the two of us. Yeah. Yeah, but at the start, I think, right, when we were younger, it felt as though, like, one one the law, how supposed to kind of Really, yeah. yeah <laughs> Back yeah, yeah. then, I also know that new business that opened up. They have a lifespan, a high chance to one. Yeah. So then it feels as though, right, you're giving an excuse uh, to create a very fun company to play. And then when you don't come back, right, then you tell me you're going dinner with your colleagues, right? Then I'm like, sorry, does your colleague not know that you have a wife waiting for you at home? Then it makes me feel like, eh, why every time uh, don't come back home is because eat dinner, karaoke, go clubbing. So it felt as though like everything was play, play, play. But over the years when he started making things serious and then when he start winning awards then I'm like eh wow the company is starting to get recognised by known media that it they are going to engage him for his work wait wait, wait uh, hold up uh. I'm sharing about this for the first time so this whole time you you just thinking oh this little pet project has gone too far it's, it's something like that lah uh. I think so leh. Wow, hey, that changes everything. Now I understand why you're so big sick leh. I don't okay, know. I, at this point, I want to be clear. It's not like we always go karaoke and what I know. <laughs> 99% of the time, we are staying back to do work. In the end, they brought the karaoke to their office. <laughs> and that was many years later. It was more of, we are always staying back to do work. Then when we finish the deck, maybe it's like 8.30. Mm. Instead of rushing home to be with my wife, I order dinner to thank everybody because I cannot afford OT, right? Which is very busted lah, okay, I know. Mm. But it was all I could afford, right? It was my way of spending $40 for, to OT five people. You know what I mean? And I tell you, at the start of our marriage, right? At first year, we quarrel a lot. Like, every night, I just waiting at home. I'd be like, eh, how come I'm alone at home? Where's my husband? And then when I call him, he say, oh, today I'll come back a bit late. Because today I'll have this, I'll have that. I mean, on times where he tell me he need to finish some work, I'll be like, oh, okay lah. But if it's like dinner, then you're not happy? No, I'm not happy lah. Less More happy. like, eh, then why your wife waiting at home, you don't come back and have dinner with me? Yeah. Yo. Yeah, I think, I think that's an interesting part in that it was rough because the first year I started the business, right? It was also the about there that we got married. So it feels like I was trying to start a family with my wife and then I, I have a baby somewhere else also. Mm. So like I have a mistress that is pregnant. That kind of vibe. Yeah, so it, like juggling two family lah. And my mistake also was always feeling like because if you are my life and you are my home, right? I expect you to understand. Ben, when Pat well, then maybe was too young to properly understand, she gets frustrated because she feels like I let her down. I get double frustration. I'm trying to build something here, can't you see? Mm. And why don't you get it, you know? Why do you need me to physically be there for everything and you need me to leave early for everything and all that stuff, right? I feel like you should understand and when she didn't understand, I just damn it. And there were no compromise. But the moment he come back early, he will make sure of it that I know, right, he came back for me. 
he will be like we quarrel maybe two three days already then we're on the like the following week like at six o'clock he know I'm going to call and I know I'm going to be like ah, if I call again I'm going to talk about the same thing like where are you why are you not home so he will come back at six or six thirty then when we are not doing anything or maybe we just go into a small fight a bit right and he's like you know today actually I have this but because ah, of what, what, what right I come back yeah. then it will make me feel bad so there was zero compromise like you think you're compromising I think I'm compromising but I actually don't have even though all those things that he do that he did was serious and he and his company did was serious right I didn't see any of of it I wasn't there to understand what the business was about but slowly slowly uh, in the next few years when they started building I started seeing more and more of his of his stuff out in the open like on buses in malls in everything then I realised that oh my god like wow it's really quite tough to come out with such thing eh. the creative juice that you need uh, is really a talented bunch of people that you need then I understand why he appreciates his colleagues so much yo I cannot get past the fact that for the first one two years you think we're not serious eh? yes <laughs> <laughs> this is such a f***ing revelation so I have a bunch of questions here from our producer uh. when did you realise John was a boss uh <laughs> Only when he start doing appraisal, then I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so when he start giving speeches, yeah, doing appraisal, he will tell me, oh, this is appraisal season. Then I say, sorry, what do you mean appraisal? Like, like how do you appraise this person? He say, I, I work with this person. I know exactly like a normal S appraisal yeah. like in this company because his office right really very fun one. If you have seen his office tour, he don't really have a boss table. Not like he sits in a room. He sits with everyone else. Do you feel the need to put on a front when you meet? my other colleagues lah, huh? do you try to impress them in any way? I don't think I try to impress but I feel that he, you would expect me to be a bit more presentable and not be like the Xiao Ting Tong that I always am. I try to be a bit more relatable also and and, and I do think that I can click with, with some of them lah. but I never try to pretend like I'm someone that I'm not. I just be more, a bit more composed. It, it took me a long time to actually feel like a boss or so. I, okay, I tell you when I felt most boss, which is probably the most awkward encounter, which was when some colleagues bring their parents to come and see the office or we meet outside or we meet at their wedding and then they will say, this one is my boss. Then you see their mother will shift the weight a bit because the mother also like, maybe she's just disappointed in the way I look right as a boss. <laughs> Or she also like want to put her best foot forward lah because this is her child's employer. But that is always a f***ing strange thing for me because like at least in my head lah, the parents are probably much more accomplished people mm. and they have spent their whole life raising up this very amazing child because if you're not amazing, it probably won't work in gravity, right? And then this very amazing child just can't be like, yeah, the fat ass, they're on my boss. You know what I mean? I feel like that's when I feel like a boss but in the most undeserving in a real like weird way, you know what I'm saying? But, but just don't, auntie auntie, you don't see this face like that. He's a very smart man. <laughs> boy. A boy. Uh. He's very eloquent too. Nanchao, do you feel like when you have to attend events for me when I'm not just John, I'm John from Gravity Media, right? Mm. Do you feel like you have to carry yourself in a certain way? Definitely la. I don't want to throw your face also la. I feel that like given my track record of now that everyone know that I changed uh, 8 drops in 13 years. <laughs> people, yeah, let's just contain this uh, guys. Well, respect me less but I think there's always a certain expectation when you see somebody else's spouse. Like somebody that you that you're speaking to, working with, that has a relationship with and then you look at their spouse, right? There is some form of judgment one like, I feel. Then very weirdly, right? The first question they always ask like, because nothing to talk about, right? right? Make small talk. Also, what do you do? Then from there, obviously, they will be like, oh, how come John's wife need to work? Wow, this one is the one. That every, everybody think I'm a tai tai. Yeah, so you sorry really about make that. it. Yeah. yeah, so they they just expect that I'm the, I'm the typical stay-home wife that I just leech off my husband. But actually, no, like, I'm an independent woman, okay? Especially in the presence of my business friends, do you feel sad that your name is John's wife? Um, I think I got used to being labelled as John's wife. Even in my own company, right, there was ever once uh, this person called my landline uh, and just, hello, you are John's wife. Uh? I, I didn't know you are John's wife. Then I just like, oh yeah, uh, uh, my name is Petrina. <laughs> I felt awkward. One. How does that make you feel? Part of me, I feel happy for you because I, I feel that like, wow, a lot of people notice my husband's work or my husband's company and what he's doing. I, I feel honoured. But at the same time, I feel that like, eh, I lost my identity. Like, Sorry. like I became a part of the story. I don't feel uncomfortable or I don't feel any lesser when people ask me if I'm John's wife. It's just that I would appreciate if they also know my name. Acknowledge, uh. <laughs> Acknowledge me. Uh. Do you think Boss John is different from normal John? John, yes. <laughs> 
Definitely. In the office, I do see you as a more hardworking person than you are at home. You are very noir at home. Is he switch off mode lah when he's at home? Yeah. Yeah. And he must recharge why? But character wise, no lah. Not like when he's at office, he will he ha ha. Then at home, he just switch off completely. No lah. He still shows affection to me at work or at home lah. I try not to be affectionate with Pat in the office. Yes. But this vlog is really changing everything. Cannot kiss him. Cannot hug him. Cannot Come do anything. Come me. Then after that. Oh yeah, then office people also will see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so office people, next okay. time you see us together, just make me kiss him and smell him. Yep. <laughs> so how do you think you have changed in these past seven or eight years? I started the business very care like And then when shit got a bit serious, I kind of realized that I cannot run the business like that. Yeah. And then that forces me to rethink what is my management style. Mm. Yeah, so to a certain extent then I also went the oppo complete opposite. I decided, okay, I must draw a line. These are not my friends, these are not my family. This is just an exchange of time and service. And it's not that I was rude or mean or anything to them. Lah, but it's just a bit more literal, a bit more transparent, a bit more cutthroat. And then I also realised that makes me unhappy. I mean, it makes them unhappy, sure, obviously. But it makes me incredibly unhappy. Then I feel like it's still a lot of sacrifices. If I'm that kind of a leader, then I feel like this sacrifice is not worth the person I'm becoming. But then again, I also don't know because I never worked in MNC before. I think I've um, seen you become more steadfast, more clear on the people that you want to work with that will be suitable for the company. Yeah. You Last time, you were a lot more emotions more than logic. You think a lot more, you value relationships or friendship a lot more. Not that now you don't, you still do, you but still less. care about people. But lesser. When the the part I talked about, where the part that I wanted to quit my own company, then I realized that when I quit, right, I even if I quit, I I don't have to restart because I have bad. And that was a that was a turning point for me because. I think for the first time in my life, right, Pat actually understood what was going on. It's very hard for me to try to explain to her because it turns into a fight. So I never tried. But when that one happened, I got her involved slightly. Yeah. And she could see for herself what was going on. And I remember she just know. Lor. When I sit down there, right, I remember got one night I was just like, I was playing a song. Then I played a song and I started tearing. And Pat just sat there. Then. She just sat there and then she just held my back. Because I know I don't know how to comfort him. There are no, no, but that was it. That was, that was the best you could do. Really. That was the best I could do, really. Yeah. There were no There was words. nothing you could have done better. That was it. That was the correct thing to do. I'll give some advice, lah, huh? If you are looking at starting your business one day, it's really an adventure. You learn and get exposed to things that you really wouldn't have. Mm. And if you get lucky like I did, you get a chance to do it right. You get a chance to affect lives. Be the person that changed somebody's life. But I do want to say, think of the reasons that you want to do this for. If you are looking to get control of your time, please know that you probably will spend more time working than you've ever had before because now this is yours. You're personally involved. You now have things to prove because your mother say, Then you're like, okay, the mommy is me, right? So now you like, why? You want to prove something to your mother now, right? So you work extra hard. You start finding yourself working 16, 18 hour days. You find yourself unable to take MC and just ing tell boss, hey, I MC today. I'm going to sleep. You know, like cannot think about these things. On the other hand, as a partner, to an entrepreneur, what I've learned is that get in the game with your partner. Whatever time that you have, right? Try and understand what he or she is doing. Because recently I started with uh, Hey Taylor. He understands the woes of being an entrepreneur and then he tries to, to come in and help me as much as I can. Help me uh, yeah. repost, reshare, whatever not. Seeing them do good, it makes you feel good also. In all your capacity that you can help, right? And make them and push them to go even further. I think that's our job. And to the fellow bosses out there, the fact that you get to become a boss, remind yourself that you got supremely lucky lah, and don't take it for granted. Okay, we've come to the end of this episode. Thank you very much for watching. I think we, we rambled on for a little bit too long. So yeah. if you have any questions, right, please write it in the comment section below. And we promise that if it's a real-ass question, we'll we will really answer properly. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Thank